So where we left off was Sebastian had just left Heidi um, to ride with a stranger to her grandfather's. And um, he's feeling a little guilty about it, but he's ready to get back home. And so he's waiting for the return train. The driver of the car was the miller at Dorfley and was taking home his sacks of flour. He had never seen Heidi, but like everybody in Dorfley, he knew all about her. He had known her parents and felt sure at once that this was the child of whom he had heard so much. He began to wonder why she had come back, and as they drove along, he entered into conversation with her. You are the child who lived with your grandfather, Elm Uncle, are you not? Yes. Didn't they treat you well down there, that you have come back so soon? Yes, it was not that. Everything in Frankfurt is as nice as it could be. Then why are you running home again? Only because Herr Seesman gave me leave, or else I should not have come. If they were willing to let you stay, why did you not remain where you are better off than at home? Because I would a thousand times rather be with Grandfather on the mountain than anywhere else in the world. You will think differently, perhaps, when you get back there grumbled the miller, and then to himself, it's strange of her, for she must know what it's like. He began whistling and said no more, while Heidi looked around her and began to tremble with excitement, for she knew every tree along the way, and there overhead were the high, jagged peaks of the mountain looking down on her like old friends. And Heidi nodded back to them and grew very and grew every moment more wild with her joy and longing, feeling as if she must jump down from the cart and run with all her might till she reached the top. But she sat quite still and did not move, although inwardly in such agitation. The clock was striking five as they drove into Dorfley. A crowd of women and children immediately surrounded the cart, for the box and the child arriving with the miller had excited the curiosity of everybody in the neighborhood, inquisitive to know whence they came and whither they were going to and whom they belonged to. As the miller lifted Heidi down, she said hastily, Thank you, grandfather will send for the trunk, and was just going to run off when first one and then another of the bystanders caught hold of her, each one having a different question to put to her. But Heidi pushed her way through them with such an expression of distress on her face that they were forced to let her go. You see, they said to one another, how frightened she is, and no wonder. And then they went on to talk of our uncle, who, how much worse he had grown that last year, never speaking a word and looking as if he would like to kill everybody he met. And if the child had anywhere else to go, to, to a, had anywhere else to go, she certainly would not run back to that old dragon's den. But here the miller interrupted them, saying he knew more about it than they did, and began telling them how a kind gentleman had brought her to Manfield and seen her off, and had given him his fare without any bargaining and extra money for himself. What was more, the child had assured him that she had had everything she wanted where she had been, and that it was her own wish to return to her grandfather. This information caused great surprise and was soon repeated all over Dorfley, and that evening there was not a house in the place in which the astounding news was not discussed, of how Heidi had of her own accord given up a luxurious home to return to her grandfather. Heidi climbed up the steep path from Dorfley as quickly as she could. She was obliged, however, to pause now and again to take breath, for the basket she carried was rather heavy, and the way got steeper as she drew nearer the top. One thought only filled Heidi's mind. Would she find the grandmother sitting in her usual corner by the spinning wheel? Was she still alive? At last, Heidi caught sight of the grandmother's house in the hollow of the mountain, and her heart began to beat. She ran faster and faster, and her heart beat louder and louder, and now she had reached the house, but she trembled so she could hardly open the door. And then she was standing inside, unable in her breathlessness to utter a sound. Oh, my God, cried a voice from the corner. That was how Heidi used to run in. If only I could have her with me once again. Who is there? It is I, I, grandmother, cried Heidi, as she ran and flung herself on her knees beside the old woman, and seizing her hands, clung to her, unable to speak for joy. And the grandmother herself could not say a word for some time, so unexpected was this happiness. 
But at last she put out her hand and stroked Heidi's curly hair and said, Yes, yes, that is her hair and her voice. Thank God that, she, that he has granted my prayer. And tears of joy fell from the blind eyes onto Heidi's hand. Is it really you, Heidi? Have you really come back to me? Yes, Grandmother, I am really here, answered Heidi in a reassuring voice. Do not cry, for I have really come back, and I am never going away again, and I shall come every day to see you, and you won't have any more hard bread to eat for some days. For look, look, and Heidi took the rolls from the basket and piled the whole twelve up on Grandmother's lap. Ah, child, child, what a blessing you bring with you the old woman exclaimed as she felt and seemed never to come to the end of the rolls. But you yourself are the greatest blessing, Heidi. And again she touched the child's hair and passed her hand over her hot cheeks and said, Say something, child, that I may hear your voice. Then Heidi told her how unhappy she had been, thinking that the grandmother might die while she was away and would never have her white rolls, and that then she would never, never see her again. Peter's mother now came in and stood for a moment, overcome with astonishment. Why, it's Heidi, she exclaimed, and yet can it be? Heidi stood up, and Brigitte now could not say enough in her admiration of the child's dress and appearance. She walked round her, exclaiming all the while, Grandmother, if you could only see her and see what a pretty frock she has on, you would hardly know her again. And the hat with the feather in it is yours too, I suppose? Put it on that... Put it on that I may see how you look in it. No, I would rather not, replied Heidi firmly. You can have it if you like. I do not want it. I have my own still. And Heidi, so saying, undid her red bundle and took out her own old hat, which had become a little more battered still during the journey. But this was no trouble to Heidi. She had not forgotten how her grandfather had called out to Deet that he never wished to see her and her hat and feathers again. And this was the reason she had so anxiously preserved her old hat, for she had never ceased to think about going home to her grandfather. But Brigitte told her not to be so foolish as to give it away. She would not think of taking such a beautiful hat. If Heidi did not want to wear it, she might sell it to the schoolmaster's daughter in Dorfley and get a good deal of money for it. But Heidi stuck to her intention and hid the hat quietly in a corner behind the grandmother's chair. Then she took off her pretty dress and put her red shawl on over her under petticoat, which left her arms bare, and now she clasped the old woman's hand. I must go home to grandfather, she said, but tomorrow I shall come again. Good night, grandmother. Yes, come again. Be sure you come again tomorrow, begged the grandmother, as she pressed Heidi's hands in hers, unwilling to let her go. Why have you taken off that pretty dress? asked Brigida because I would rather go home to grandfather as I am, or else perhaps he would not know me. You hardly did at first. Brigitte went with her to the door, and there said in a rather mysterious voice, you might have kept on your dress. He would have known you all right, but you must be careful, for Peter tells me that Alm uncle is always now in a bad temper and never speaks. Heidi bid her good night and continued her way up the mountain, her basket on her arm. All around her the steep green slopes shone bright in the evening sun, and soon the great gleaming snow field up above came in sight. Heidi was obliged to keep on pausing to look behind her, for the higher peaks were behind her as she climbed. Suddenly a warm red glow fell on the grass at her feet. She looked back again. She had not remembered how splendid it was, nor seen anything to compare to it in her dreams. For there the two high mountain peaks rose into the air like two great flames, and the whole snow field had turned crimson, and rosy-colored clouds floated in the sky above. The grass upon the mountain sides had turned to gold. The rocks were all aglow, and the whole valley was bathed in golden mist. And as Heidi stood gazing around her at all this splendor, the tears ran down her cheeks for very delight and happiness and impulsively she put her hands together and lifted her high, her eyes to heaven thanked god aloud for having brought her home thanked him that everything was as beautiful as ever more beautiful even than she had thought and that it was all hers again once more and she was overflowing so with joy and thankfulness that she could not find words to thank him enough 
Not until the glory began to fade could she tear herself away. Then she ran on so quickly that in a very little while she caught sight of the tops of the fir trees above the hut roof, then the roof itself, and at last the whole hut. And there was Grandfather sitting as in old days smoking his pipe, and she could see the fir trees waving in the wind. Quicker and quicker went her little feet, and before um, Uncle had time to see who was coming, Heidi had rushed up to him, thrown down her basket, and flung her arms around his neck, unable in the excitement of seeing him again to say more than, Grandfather, 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 over and over again. And the old man himself said nothing. For the first time for many years, his eyes were wet, and he had to pass his hand across them. Then he unloosed Heidi's arms, put her on his knee, and after looking at her for a moment, said, So you have come back to me, Heidi. He said, How is that? You don't look much of a grand lady. Did they send you away? Oh, no, Grandfather, said Heidi eagerly. You must not think that. They were all so kind, Clara and Grandmama and Herr Seesman. But you see, Grandfather, I did not know how to bear myself till I got home again to you. I used to think I should die, for I felt as if I could not breathe. But I never said anything, because it would have been ungrateful. And then suddenly, one morning, quite early, Herr Seesman said to me, but I think it was partly the doctor's doing, perhaps, but perhaps it's all in the letter. And Heidi jumped down and fetched the roll and the letter and handed them both to her grandfather. That belongs to you, said the latter, laying the roll down on the bench beside him. Then he opened the letter, read it through, and without, and without a word, put it in his pocket. Do you think you can still drink milk with me, Heidi? He asked, taking the child by the hand to go into the hut. But bring your money with you. You can buy a bed and bedclothes and dresses for a couple of years with it. I am sure I do not want it, replied Heidi. I have got a bed already, and Clara has put such a lot of clothes in my box that I shall never want any more. Take it and put it in the cupboard. You will want it some day, I have no doubt. Heidi obeyed and skipped happily after her grandfather into the house. She ran into all the corners, delighted to see everything again, and then went up the ladder. But there she came to a pause and called down in a tone of surprise and distress, Oh, Grandfather, my bed's gone. <laughs> I am sure. Oh, I'm sorry. We can soon make it up again, he answered her from below. I did not know that you were coming back. Come along now and have your milk. Heidi came down, sat herself on her high stool in the old place, and then, taking up her bowl, drank her milk eagerly, as if she had never come across anything so delicious. And as she put down her bowl, she exclaimed, Our milk tastes nicer than anything else in the world, Grandfather. A shrill whistle was heard outside. Heidi darted out like a flash of lightning. There were the goats leaping and springing among the rocks with Peter in their midst. When he caught sight of Heidi, he stood still with astonishment and gazed speechlessly at her. Heidi called out, Good evening, Peter, and then ran in among the goats. Little swan, little bear, do you know me again? And the animals evidently recognized her voice at once. For, for they began rubbing their heads against her and bleating loudly as if for joy. And as she called the other goats by name, one after the other, they all came scampering towards her, helter-skelter and crowding around her. The impatient greenfinch sprang into the air and over two of her companions in order to get nearer. And even the shy little snowflake butted the great Turk out of her way in quite a determined manner which left him standing taken aback by her boldness and lifting his beard in the air as much as to say, you see who I am. Heidi was out of her mind with delight at being among all her old friends again. She flung her arms round the pretty little snowflake, stroked the, obstreperous, the obstreperous green finch while she, she herself was thrust at from all sides by the affectionate and confiding goats. And so at last she got near to where Peter was still standing, not having yet got over his surprise. Come down, Peter, cried Heidi, and say good evening to me. So you are back again, he found words to say at last, and now ran down and took Heidi's hand, which she was holding out in greeting, and immediately put the same question to her, which he had been, which he had been in the habit of doing in the old days when they returned home in the evening. Will you come out with me again tomorrow? 
Not tomorrow, but the day after, perhaps. For tomorrow, I must go down to Grandmother. I am glad you are back, said Peter, while his whole face beamed with pleasure. And then he prepared to go on with his goats. But he never had had so much trouble with them before, for when at last, by coaxing and threats, he had got them all together, and Heidi had gone off with an arm over either head of her grandfather's too, the whole flock suddenly turned and ran after her. Heidi had to go inside the stall with her too and shut the door, or Peter would never have got home that night. When Heidi went indoors after this, she found her bed already made up for her. The hay had been piled high for it and smelt deliciously, for it had only just been got in, and the grandfather had carefully spread and tucked in the clean sheets. It was with a happy heart that Heidi lay down in it that night, and her sleep was sounder than it had been for a whole past year. The grandfather got up at last at least ten times during the night and mounted the ladder to see if Heidi was all right and showing no signs of restlessness and to feel that the hay he had mounted the uh, he that he excuse me and to feel that the hay he had stuffed into the round window was keeping the moon from shining too brightly upon her but Heidi did not stir she had no need now to wander about for the great burn, burning longing of her heart was satisfied. She had seen the high mountains and rocks alight in the evening aglow. She had heard the wind in the fir trees. She was at home again on the mountain. Wow. <laughs> Doesn't that make you feel happy inside? Oh, it does me. I feel like I'm the grandfather and Heidi just came home to me. So tomorrow we will read Sunday Bells, chapter 14. I'll see you then.